This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. We're doing another Cosmic Queries. These have become fan favorites. I guess I understand why, because you get to participate. Well, actually, if you're a Patreon member, you get to participate in asking those questions at the entry level of Patreon. Today's topic, infinity, with my friend and fellow physicist, Stefan Alexander. We'll get to him in a moment. Let me introduce my co-host, Nagin Frasad. Nagin, it's been so long. Oh, my God. Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm your your honorary um, astrophysicist comedian friend. Yes. <laughs> Everybody needs one of My, those, right? Mine, right, minus any of the astrophysics, just to be clear. I have none of that. You are a host of the, the show Fake the Nation. That's right. And in addition to Fake the Nation, you've got some side gig where you've got a succession recap. What's up with that? That's right. I'm doing a succession recap pod on the Fake the Nation feed. And I, in addition to talking about space, I love talking about billionaires. So those are my two <laughs> main interests right now. Um, so yeah, definitely subscribe to hear all the succession chatter. Well, help me welcome my friend and colleague, Stefan Alexander. Stefan, you're a returning guest. You yes, first I appeared am. with us uh, with when we were on the Nat Geo channel. Uh, and you had a, it was a TV, Nat Geo TV episode. You're a theoretical physicist, a cosmologist, a musician, and an author and professor of physics at Brown University up in Providence, Rhode Island. And among those books, the one I remember most is from now six years ago, seven years ago, The Jazz of Physics. Let me get the right <laughs> subtitle here. The Secret Link Between Music <laughs> and the Structure of the Universe. And then you follow that up with Fear of a Black Universe, an outsider's guide to the future of physics. So you're still at it, but you're also a jazz saxophonist. So you're out of control here, it seems. Uh, you also appeared in the 2022 Netflix documentary, A Trip to Infinity, and that is the subject of today, Infinity, which boggles everybody's mind who's ever thought about it. And so could you just tell us what infinity wait can I, can I tell you my first encounter with infinity please so i am five when kennedy is assassinated okay that's how old i am and there's the burial and they put him in in arlington cemetery and there's a flame there at the burial spot and they called it the eternal flame and i said does this mm -hmm. flame never go out? How could it never go out? What? And and at age five, this <laughs> with me. Okay, sorry. <laughs> this was like, <laughs> how? At night, do they secretly put more oil in the flame? You know, but does, the camera doesn't show it. I was, I, and then I would later learn, yes, that was, it's figurative, that it's eternal, but there is a formal mathematical concept called infinity. So, Mm. Nagin, did you have any existential angst over infinity at any time in your life? Just to um, put that on, put it on the table right now, because we got the man uh, who's going to straighten us out. God, I feel, I feel, I mean, it, I had just a, an existential angst as a teenager in general, and started reading all of the works of Jean Paul Sartre as like a sixteen-year-old and not fully understanding. Oh, them. that'll mess you up. That'll mess you up big time. Yeah. So that messed me up big time, <laughs> um, and it led to a lot of brooding and a lot of eye rolls on my part. Okay. But um, it didn't, it, it didn't freak me out the way Infinity freaked you out. Okay, okay. All right, so Stefan, tell me about Infinity. What What's up with that? Let me admit something to you and again. I don't know what infinity is. Okay, I mean, I can- Okay, we're done here. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> Nikki, you got any jokes to take us out? <laughs> okay. Wow, I mean, who first... booked this guy? <laughs> I know, right? Right? I think my first encounter with infinity was just as a kid. Like, you know, you get taught how to count and you say, okay, let me count. One, two, three. And you realize that you can just go on counting for eternity. And, you know, at some point, I think it was a friend or a teacher, I forget, I was in third grade, who said, actually, there's this number, it's called infinity. And so basically, once you get to the largest possible number, you can continue counting. And 
And infinity is that number that goes on basically and of course to what? To infinity. And, and plus the old the old geek contest is what's the biggest mm -hmm. number you can name, then you name it and say, is that plus one? You know, and that's how you yeah. win. You, you right. win the, the geek counting contest. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And then of course there's um I think the other one, I think it's I wanna say it's Zeno's paradox. So Ste Stefan, what's your simplest example of the of this of Zeno's paradox? Well, imagine you have this turtle that's trying to run a hundred meters. Okay, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> just the just the thought of it. But okay, go on. <laughs> okay, trying to run a hundred meters. But the rule is that every time he gets halfway, he has to go half of that. So if he gets to fifty meters, he has to now run twenty-five meters. And once he gets to twenty-five meters, he has to run a half of that. And he continues successively doing that. He ends up getting never getting to a hundred meters. Because you can always take the remaining distance and cut it in half. And you all take the remaining distance and cut it in half. And so that remaining distance the... and cut it in yeah. Okay, so this will just go on forever. That just goes on forever, exactly. Will he ever reach the 100, 100, 100 meter mark? According to this rule, he will never reach a 100, 100 meter mark because he, he just keeps um, you know, um, covering half of the, of the original distance successively to the point where you know, it ends up being a half of, you know, you know, ends up being one over infinity. Okay, and so, but the turtle does go the hundred meters. So maybe that's what that's what I guess Nagin. I guess that's why it's called a paradox. Okay, <laughs> because the, the, the turtle just isn't like stopped in slow motion. I can't go. I don't know why. I'm in infinity land. I'm in no. The turtle just walks and puts his head across the finish line, and that's why it's a paradox. Today, how did it get? To you know, to the hundred meter, if this is a possibility, by taking yeah. an infinite number of 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 havings, yes, yes, okay. yes, and it also it, get, it brings new meaning into like let's go splitsies on something because it's like if you keep you can you could just keep going splitsies and it just never splits, never, mm -hmm. never. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, I thought I have a solution. There's a point where you have atoms, and how you can go half the distance when there's no more thing to have. And then that is just, you just there. That was my solution when I was a kid. That actually is a nice solution to that paradox, by the way. Yes. You basically reach the pixel size of mm -hmm. space time. That's and right. then you can't have that pixel. So you grab that pixel and you're home free. So that was, That's it. That was my solution. You just, you just <laughs> yeah. move on. Nagin, what was, what was your solution to Xeno's paradox when you were a kid? My solution was to get frustrated and then go eat a bag of Funyuns. And that's kind of how oh, I dealt. Funyuns. <laughs> Another place where we encounter infinity is just like, let's look at um, fractions, right? I have one over two. Well, you, if you tell a kid, hey, I'm going to give you half of a slice of pizza, of, half of a pie of pizza, or one quarter of a pie of pizza, right? The kid will know I want half of the pie of pizza. They know that the, the larger you make that fraction of the, of the slice, right, they get a smaller slice of pizza. You're going to get one sixteenth of a slice of a pizza versus, you know, one quarter of a slice of a pie, right? You know, the kid knows that the larger, that one over whatever it is of the pizza, they're going to get a smaller piece of the pie. If you tell a kid, you're going to get one half of the slice of a, of a pie of pizza, yeah, that's good. If I say you get one over one of the pizza, well, a smart kid will say, "I get the whole pizza. I get the whole pie, one over one." But now, if I say you get, if I make, if I go smaller than one, which is smaller than one is something that looks like zero, one over zero, then that number goes. That's what infinity is. The number gets bigger. A fraction gets bigger and bigger and bigger the smaller and smaller I make the bottom number, right? So that's another place where we encounter infinity. So you, we left call that that... The, you left out the middle part there. So if it's one over one, that's a pizza, right? That's the mm -hmm. whole pie. If it's yeah. one over a half, Ooh. It's two. That, that's two pies, right? It's one two divided pies. by a half. A half goes that's twice right. into one. Very and then good, one yes. over three, that's three pies. Three that, pies, exactly. I mean, one over a third. Thank you very much. Yeah, so now just... if I do one over like, you know, you know, if I see, keep, as you said, one over um, one third, one over one fourth, one over whatever. Now we go to one over one infinity. I get infinite pies. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and that we call that a division by zero. And so computers crash, actually, because 
you know, if you, Neil, you used to, I know that very well that you used to write code when you were an astrophysicist, um, when you were a research astrophysicist, because somebody told me so. And, okay. um, and so, you know, you used to, you know, you wanted to avoid these kind of things when you wrote code, these divisions by zero, because the, what would happen, right? Yeah, if the, the program crashes. Yeah, it crashes, exactly. The computer doesn't know what to do with it. By the way, in Star Trek, smoke would come out of the computer if they did that. <laughs> Are you trying to say the computer was the computer was doing things that you didn't want to do? Yeah, yeah, computer would <laughs> Captain Kirk would outreason the computer and then the smoke would come out. But in modern times no, they just the computer it just crashes. Yeah. Wait, can I this is actually giving me flashbacks of when I first had to graph an asymptote. Oh. which is this is essentially right asymptotic yes, yes, this situation yes. and i remember just being like oh let them touch let the thing touch oh, the line you, you cared for them you wanted I, them. I wanted them to touch <laughs> it felt you know it just felt like uh a missed connection forever you wow. know well no and, they yes. do they do touch at infinity <laughs> oh, no, so get your ass to infinity and you'll see them touched until no, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but right so stefan asymptote is another one of these concepts right yeah it's a great asymptotes. word it's, it's a great word too right you, it's can, a fun you kind word. of you almost get there but never quite until yeah. you go out to infinity um yeah. and that's a very good that's another in fact that's very relevant um to physics and by the way the, the ideas of the asymptote and this division by zero, all of these things, you know, um, does, you know, touch, you know, have, you know, a deep relationship with, with physics and astrophysics and cosmology. So you say it shows um, up in a lot of different ways. It shows up in a lot of different ways. And we physicists, you know, there's of course, philosophers that pay a lot of attention to infinities, mathematicians actually make a, a, a living from it. And we physicists try to run away from it. <laughs> How do we try you do to that? avoid it. <laughs> I'm trying to see a, a mathematician busker on the street, you know, <laughs> trying to make a living off of infinity. You know, I don't, I can't, I'm trying to picture that. I don't, I'm sorry. Uh, someone makes a living off infinity. But, but, uh, Nagin, do you have, you have questions from, from, from our uh, Patreon members? Yeah. I, I absolutely do. Let me dive in with a, a question from Captain James Riley. Um, they write, it always drives me crazy when I hear that a singularity has infinite density or that the universe in is infinite. Is this just something we label things that we don't fully understand? I, I hate the concept of infinity. It seems like a cop out. I love that. Oh. Which is how I felt about asymptotes. <laughs> <laughs> so I to I'm totally with you, Captain Riley. Yeah, so, so Stefan, uh, yeah. it's, you know, the captain's got a point here. You know, uh, are, we, just, are point. we just invoking infinity because we can't otherwise solve the problem? Uh, yes or no. Um, can, can, we, can we evoke one of your favorite astrophysical objects, Neil? What's the that? black hole? Sure, let's do it. Because I think this is a perfect, a very good example of where you kind of get to have your cake and eat it too. Because here it is an um, interesting thing. Um, when Einstein came up with his theory of general relativity, which describes you know, how matter and energy can warp the space-time fabric and create the effect that we call gravity, um, a, a mathematical prediction, a mathematical solution came out of that, um, that theory. This theory spat out an, a very extreme, um, sort of extreme warp in space time from a, from a very, you know, from a basically a collapse, a star that has collapsed into a very dense region. And this thing is called a black hole. And uh, Neil, you've done some excellent um, reports on that in the past. But just to be clear, Negin, he mm -hmm. said that Einstein's theory just spat out the equations for a black hole, but with the help of really brilliant people who understood the theory. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It didn't just poop it out like. It did, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Although I like the imagery of just a bunch of numbers coming out of someone's yeah. butt. So <laughs> right. It so, just pooped fact, it out en route to whatever it was doing. It, no, no, some brilliant was, people applied. Brilliant people. It, yeah, applied Einstein's general relativity. Now that they had that framework to arrive at a black hole as a new under a new object, a new prediction. Right. Yeah. And it was a mat. It was literally, you know, the Einstein theory was ten, what we call ten couple nonlinear partial differential equations. Very comp, very very um, difficult, and still difficult to solve. So you're lucky when you get one solution, and the black hole solution or the Schwarzschild solution 
named after I think it was um what's it was it called Schwarzschild? Carl Schwarzschild, Carl Schwarzschild. Thank you. Yeah, um, his nephew was Martin Schwarzschild, who was at Princeton. While I was there, actually, he had some good wisdom to share. But yeah, Carl Schwarzschild, who uh, sadly died uh, in the field in, during the First World War. Uh, so we're glad he banged out the Schwarzschild solution to black holes before uh, he caught right. a bullet. Yeah. I, so. I, I'm going to be funny now. He didn't spit it out. He banged it out. Banged it out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Dark. He's something. He, anyway, <laughs> it, was a, it was a majestical solution. But at that time, like people, some people, and one of my mentors, David Finkelstein, of uh, the Eddington Finkelstein um, coordinate system, which was based on Schwarzschild's solution about the event horizon, right, the point of no return once you fall into this black hole after it gobbles you up. You know, this was seen by many to just be some mathematical trickery, some mathematical solution that has not, no element of reality until, of course, we found one. Okay. Right. Uh, we found many, right? Um, now there are black hole laboratories out there. Okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so the thing that I find interesting about that was people already knew that the black hole, this, the reason why they thought it was a mathematical artifact or mathematical gobbledygook of, the, of, of, of Einstein's theory, some, some physicists thought, was because it actually had a singularity. It actually had an infinity. What do I mean by that? If you actually... And this is the idea example we used before. If you look at the, you know, if I fall into a black hole and I go, if I, if I, um, you know, the scribe going in as some, the radius, you know, like a ball, think of the black hole as a gigantic ball in outer space, a, a gigantic invisible dark ball. And as I go in to the center of the black hole, this radius will eventually go to zero. But if I divide, and it turns out that the density and the force really falls off. It actually decreases as one over R, sometimes one over R squared, one over R. So what happens when R goes to zero? You get an infinity. You get an infinity in the density, the mass density. Infinite you also density. Get an infinite density, thank you. You get an infinity in the forces, right? And you get an infinity in the curvature because the curvature becomes infinite as well. So, the, so, so I, mm -hmm. okay, so I think the person who asked the question knew that that's what you would say. The question <laughs> is, uh -huh. is that real? Is it, yes. is it, no. Good, good, no, this is interesting. The black I'm holes pretending the I'm the dude who asked, I'm, I'm, I'm the captain. No, you're just making this, <laughs> you just, <laughs> how can you have anything that's infinite anything? That's a, that's, that's a right. physical thing. How is that even possible? We we agree you can do that mathematically. No one's arguing that. Now you're going to tell me an actual physical thing hits the infinity that your math delivered. Yeah, because like at the end of the day, if we're looking at like a tup, if the black hole is in a Tupperware container, right? Yes. Can it good. then? Okay, where are you going with this? <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay with you. Go. <laughs> I'm just hole. saying, like. It can't, if it's infinitely dense, the Tupperware container is going to break, right? Or whatever. Does that make any sense? <laughs> no, that's actually, so that's right. So what, it's interesting that you, you had a theory that put out a sick solution. So many people thought that's not real, but then you find this thing in reality. So what do you do with the fact that this infinity is there in the prediction? And so then this is where you get disagreements in, amongst physicists and astrophysicists. Some people say, well, there's something that replaces that theory, um, meaning general relativity. There's some new physics that we yet we do not know. Some people say you have to accept the infinity. Um, and, you know, there's something is censoring that infinity from actually realizing itself and coming, and doing, coming out and doing bad things. Um, in the world, maybe this horizon. It's I like that us. idea that nature mm -hmm. might be censoring our infinities. I yes, like and that. If, and and so fact, it could it could mm -hmm. be that the infinity is the limit of the applicability of this theory of the universe. That's 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 a take I take actually. That's my okay. All that's right. Where I, I land right. on. That's where I come on. Okay. Now, but now where where does mm -hmm. the Tupperware go? We got yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. I feel like you Back to the you Tupperware. have some really <laughs> yeah some really expansive Tupperware. Okay. 
leftovers forever in your Tupperware. Leftovers forever, because it's infinitely dense. It could feed everyone <laughs> forever. We got to take a quick break, but when we come back, more with Stefan Alexander, who's taken us to infinity and beyond with, of course, my co-host, Nagin Fassad. We'll be right back. We're back. Star Talk Cosmic Queries. We're talking about infinity. Oh, yeah. And we got one of the world's experts who thinks about this subject, Stefan Alexander, a friend and colleague, professor of physics at Brown University, Rhode Island. And I got Nagin Farsad. Uh, Nagin, you wrote, you wrote a book. I did. Some, a few years ago. Yeah. Just, just, it was, and I'm trying to remember the title. Is it How to Make White People Laugh or something like that? What yes, was, How to Make White was, People Laugh. Neil, it wasn't for you. No, it wasn't for me. That's why I never, I, I heard about the book, but I said, no, nope, this is not, no, nope, not, not addressed me. to yeah. me. <laughs> that's right. Okay. It's How to Make White People Laugh. So I remembered the title correctly. That's the title. Okay, yeah, that's the cool. one. Very cool. Still relevant. Still need to make like white people laugh. So that's if I uh, want to make white people laugh, I, I, I might pick it up. All right, I'll pick yeah, it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, out. check out the tricks of my trade. All right, all right. The, under the hood, as, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Stefan, you were going to add to the point about the black hole singularity being an infinite density point, and possibly others stepping in to save the day. Yes. So there. Yeah. Uh, there are other types of singularities that show up in physics that can maybe, I think, that where we were able to, what we call, tame or cure the singularity. And the beast. People, uh, the beast, yes. Yeah. So the one, beast. Was, one was the electric charge and the electric force. So if you look at a charged particle, um, like, you know, yeah, a good old charged particle. <laughs> An electron, um, or, okay. Or, or a magnet, or a magnet, right? Mm -hmm. um, the magnetic force also between two magnets actually, as I bring the magnets closer together and closer together, actually turns out that that force, when you go to zero distance, according to the equations, that work really well for all of our motors and all of our you know, electricity and all that wind energy and all that stuff. It uses the same physics that we trust. But according to this physics, when you go here, all that good stuff goes out the window because you will get, according to the theory, an infinite force and an infinite amount of energy. And mm. we do not measure that because the magnets touch and nothing blows up. And you're strong enough to make the magnets touch if they're resisting it's, each other. That's example. right. You're okay. strong enough to okay. do that. But according right. to this thing, the magnets should never touch. You can never be strong enough because you require infinite force to make them touch. All right. But, okay, so what solved that problem? It turns out Richard Feynman and you know his colleagues figured out Actually, there's quantum physics going on. So what happens is that quantum physics fuzzifies and softens in a sense. Like, you know, they're You quantum... just made up that word, fuzzify. I'm pretty sure you just made it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. But okay, we know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, the, let the record show okay. he's making up words as he goes along. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> which, by yeah. the way, which is what infinity sometimes sound li sounds like. Just throw in <laughs> yes. the word infinity, and it, yeah. that's right. exactly the point of the question. It sounds like a cop-out, like it right. fuzzifies. Yeah. But continue. Fuzzifying <laughs> infinity. Okay, right. so... So this is this, so weird things happen. So in the quantum world now, if you say, okay, you know, the force between the magnets, you know, um, is really what we call a non-quantum or classical theory. It doesn't require quantum things. What do you mean by quantum now? Well, it means that there are things called quanta, and in this case, the thing that becomes the quanta is light, because light is actually the thing that's mediating, communicating the force actually. And so what Feynman taught us is that you can't no longer think about the magnetic field as a magnetic field, but actually as a particle called a photon that gets transmitted, bouncing back and forth. And as a photon goes, is communicating this force and the magnet gets closer and closer, the photon can actually, you know, do weird things. It can do weird quantum Okay, leaps, but the point is well, you are you know? saving the magnetic field problem invoking quantum physics. Yes, are, yes. Is quantum physics gonna save you from the center of the black hole, from the singularity? Very good. So there are now people, not people, the great physicists um, um, that argue, like Stephen Hawking being one, and Gerardo Tuft and Lenny Susskind and others, that said, ah, what if what happened with, you know, with ma real magnets, um, by analogy, there's something quantum. What, what quantum? Quantum gravity. Mm -hmm. There's something to do with gravity being a quantum, having a quantum effect. What mm -hmm. if that would like, 
jump in and save today, and as I go into the singularity of a black hole, you don't get infinity, but you get new quantum effects. What would that look like? You'd yeah. have to marry quantum physics with Einstein relativity for that. You have right? to do that. In some kind and of shotgun wedding, right some at that kind of last shotgun moment. Wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. But here's the problem. None yeah. of Gravity, the in-laws are happy in that None scenario. of the in-laws. <laughs> if, here's a funny thing. If gravity and quantum mechanics were to be a couple, they're very incompatible with each other. Every reconcilable differences that this allowed them from actually making a bond. Okay. Yeah. Well, all right. It's like yeah, when so, I've tried to date a Pisces, it never works out. You know, I could have told you that. Why didn't you call me? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's the, so that's the, we replied to the captain whether or not we fully satisfied his question. So what are the questions you got, Nagin? All right, let's move on to David. Um, he's actually happy to submit his very first question after years of, of being a Patreon subscriber. Oh, Here excellent. It is. Oh, David, does he have a last name or is it just um, David? He just, it's just David. He's like Madonna. Okay. He just goes by the one. Um, I once heard Alex Filipenko explain infinity in our universe is operationally infinite, infinite to us because we can never achieve the edges of it, not even at the speed of light, because space is expanding faster than the speed of light, almost like going up an escalator that is going faster than you can walk up it. You'll never reach the top. Is my small mind grasping this concept of an infinite universe? And if so, or if not, how do multiple universes fit into our intimate infinite universe? Ooh, I love yeah. those questions. Yes, yeah, Stefan. But I love that, that escalator metaphor uh, because if, if that it, if that's right, that puts things into making sense for me. Right, right. Right. Well, so, I'm going to ask my I'm going to ask my colleague Neil to to, um, to <laughs> summarize that question for me. <laughs> okay. So the way I, the way I look at it is, and I can I can contribute a little bit to this answer. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll, I'll contribute two parts. You take care of the rest. Mm -hmm. So yes, if the universe is expand, and Alex Filipenko is a colleague of mine. We came up together actually in graduate school, uh, and so if you um, if you have an infinite universe that's expanding. Right, you'll never reach the edge. Like, and I'd love, like you said, we all agree that escalator analogy is excellent. However, you don't need an infinite universe to never reach the edge. For example, the surface of the Earth is not infinite, yet you could just keep walking and never reach the edge. So don't equate reaching an edge with something having to be infinite because the space can turn back on itself and you can end up just making loops and, ne and never stop walking and always walk in the same direction, whichever which direction you choose and you'll never get to the edge. So that's the, my first point to that. And the second point is if you embed, so I can have a sheet of paper that's infinite, infinite, okay? Now, but a sheet of paper is two dimensions. I can have another sheet of paper that's infinite and put them one centimeter apart from each other and they will never intersect, even though they're both infinite because I pulled one into a third dimension. And so when you embed infinities in higher dimensions, you got no problems at all. You can cram put them in, to, uh, uh, cram as many as you want in there and there's plenty of room. So, you take it from there, Stefan. You, you, you took all the good examples. <laughs> oh, no! Oh, <laughs> well, I'm going to, yeah, there's another, there's another, um, and of course, you know, there's um, infinite time. Oh! You can have a finite world, but the clock can continue ticking for, you know, for an infinity. And, um, you know, so that's, that's, an, that's an, another example of, of, of um, you know, meaning that the universe um, could be finite in extent, but just continue expanding for infinity. Um, so the so universe is like a is like a vampire that never dies in that scenario. Nagin, it's exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> Great, got it. Just wanted to explain for the listeners. M minus the blood, minus the blood. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and just to follow up on what you just said, Stefan. So if the spherical universe were expanding. Mm -hmm. You would still have a finite universe, but you could walk in it forever. 
even though it's expanding. I mean, so there's a lot of variations on this geometry that make for fascinating thought. No, absolutely, this. absolutely. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, um, one of the great mathematicians, um, and, um, you know, somebody that you know, Neil, yeah. he went off and made a lot of money, but he literally, you know, he, he put a lot of money towards the this, this satellite so that he can, you know, know about the Big Bang called a Simons Observatory. Oh, yes, yes. Jim Simons, he's, he's a geometrist, so he came up with some, uh, some important mathematics all about this topic. He believes, he wants to put his bet that the universe actually is finite. It's a, what, you know, a, a, a sphere. It has a spherical geometry. And if you, you know, if you play with it, if you play with the, the assumptions and the data and the statistics enough, you might be able to still accommodate um, that the universe actually might be finite in terms of the data. Um, so that's an interesting side note. And, and just for, in case people don't know, Jim Simons uh, made his billions trading in the stock market, bringing high level mathematics to his predictive models that no one knew was even possible at the time. And, and now he's put his money back to further research. There's the Simons uh, Foundation, the Simons uh, Center for uh, Research in Physics, Biology, and Computing, um, which is right here in, in uh, downtown Manhattan. Oh, I thought you were going to say, which is on a yacht, because that's what he gets to afford now. <laughs> he does have a yacht, and I've been on his yacht, and it's called oh the Archimedes. Oh, my God. And it's yeah. called the Archimedes. The Archimedes. Of course, of course. Yes, yes. Yeah. So thank you for that, for queuing. That was your cue. Yeah. Okay. Time for another question? Yeah, please, please. So from Gavin Bamber, he says, hello from North Vancouver, please visit. Can string theory be represented by music? If so, would it be more of a monophony, classical or jazz? Would it be a complete composition or would it continue on into infinity? Wait, is that a word, monophony? Is that, is that a, like, does that mean a one note concert? Is that <laughs> what, what he's saying there? That's what it sounds like to me, but maybe yeah. it's something else. Oh yeah, my God, so what, I, I have two of the smartest people on the planet and and none of us know if that's like a, a word. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, this is actually, actually a good point to actually talk about, um, you know, going back to Feynman so, and, and his colleagues that they use quantum mechanics to smoothen out, for lack of better words, de, de infinitize the infinity. That, I made up a new word. <laughs> okay, we're up to six new words this episode, right? Keep going. <laughs> and, you know, there, there is now a, you know, an uber quantum theory, and that theory is called string theory. Um, and it turns out that just when you thought that quantum mechanics actually would help with infinities, it turned out that quantum mechanics itself had infinities, <laughs> okay? And we call these things divergences or, you know, uh, instabilities. These are all words that just basically mean that things in your theory go to infinity, okay? okay. And so anyway, so in a long... Uh, it turns out well, you're, that saying, is... uh, you're saying quantum physics was brought on to possibly help with the classical infinities, but mm -hmm. then it introduces finities, infinities of its own. That's correct. Yes. Okay, that yeah. ain't right. That ain't right. That ain't right. That right. Ain't, right. right. And um, these things are called, like, say, ultraviolet or infrared divergences for the audience member who want to get fancy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> now, okay. Um, so it turns out that string theory actually one of the reasons why many people got behind string theory, including a younger version of myself. Um, uh, when I was a young research, younger researcher, um, was that it actually was an infinity-free theory, quantum theory, actually, mm -hmm. that contained gravity in it as well, contained, you know, aspects of all the forces, but you had to live in 10 dimensions, okay? Uh, um, there's, a, there's some, some give. <laughs> and there's then a going catch. Back to what, there's a catch. <laughs> and, if, and, you know, and going back to what Neil exactly said, is that now that you have the, all these other dimensions, you can go and stuff infinities on those on those other dimensions now, right? Um, but anyway, string theory is such a such a theory that does that. Um, it it do, it's an it's a theory that does not have in its mathematical structures and the solution it spits out. And it does not have infinities. So we all love that. It's elegant and beautiful, <laughs> and um, it's also a musical theory. That's correct. So your your um, um, your member. Um, is quite right to say that string theory has a musical sense to it. And I'm happy to, to, to speak to that. I do want to hear what you have to say about string theory and music, because that is a part of the, the, the questioner's uh, uh, content. But we got to take a quick break. When we come back, the third and final segment 
of infinity. Does infinity have three segments? <laughs> Can it have three <laughs> segments? I don't I know. You got four. <laughs> Look, it has come two. back and find out on Star Talk Cosmic Queries. We're back. Third and final segment of Cosmic Queries. Queries the Infinity Edition Ooh, with Stefan Alexander, a physicist who's thought a lot about cosmology and infinities. And of course, Nagin Prasad. Nagin. Hello. Love having you here. It's been too long. Come back more often, okay? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right. I, I, but so, I'm, I'm, I'm on nearly every show in other dimensions. Oh! <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> you and, and have if, to go to the other dimensions, I and, think, is what's going on. And if you don't tell me that dimension, I will never find you. Right? <laughs> you, you can, you'll, be fi- I'll, you'll be found only when you allow yourself to be found. Yeah. I've also got hot dog fingers in those other dimensions, but don't oh, worry about it. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Everything everywhere all at once, I think that was. Yeah, so, so St- Stefan, why would string theory have to do with music at all? Just because it has the word string in it and just because their music has string instruments. I don't you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weak yes, connection. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. that feels like really weak. <laughs> yes. Well, it's yeah. So um, they they should have just called it maybe something like um, guitar string theory. Maybe, maybe better. <laughs> um, but yeah, the you know so string theory one of the good reason ways was able to solve these infinities had to do with an assumption that we made about even our physics pre string theory, which is that things fundamentally are made up of point particles, and the minute you talk about a particle, then you're forced to go to zero, with the, and that's when things blew up on you. The infinity came, uh, revealed itself. But if, and the idea of string theory is that replace, nothing is ever made up of a point particle anymore. When you, even when you take a magnifying glass and you, you try to resolve that point, instead of what looks like a point from really, really far away, like this thing here. Looks like a point, yeah? Mm-hmm. All right. I'm, I'm faking mm-hmm. it to look like a point. Okay. Yeah. And then you He's far zoom away, in, so it's a point. And you, zoom you zoom in, zoom in and it, you realize it's a string. But okay. it's not just any old string. The string, because it's quantum, has to be vibrating. And we know very well the physics of any kind of vibrating string. The vibrating string generates a spectrum or, uh, you know, it generates um, characteristics, types of waves. And these waves are called standing waves. What is a standard wave? It's basically what you know as a note, a tone, a okay. particular type of vibration um, that can be represented as a sound um, or you know, a note on the piano. So like when I play a note on a piano, what's really going on is that there's a piano string hidden and that piano string is vibrating. And because it vibrates, it undulates at a very, at a given rate, that rate of vibration called a frequency denotes what we call a tone or a sound. And so, so string theory, the physics of strings, really does match on very nicely oh, okay. to the physics of how notes are generated in instruments. Right, so sorry to badmouth you at the front of that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Nagin needs to apologize too. I'm so, so, so sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, so it's an analogy, it's an analogy, but it's a really no, no, but, good but analogy. I, I get it, I get it. it, it feels right, it feels right. All right. Nagin, keep going. We well, have, actually, the last Jose, Jose Marcelino had a question that feels related to that. Um, he's he's, he's uh, writing from Dallas, Texas. He wrote, I was wondering, do sound waves have any mass? And if so, what is the difference in mass created by the sounds of musical instruments versus the sounds created by a computer? Okay. Well, sound waves do have mass because actually the scientific word for a sound wave is what we call a pressure wave. So anytime like I create any sort of change in the pressure, it could be the pressure of, on you know that's why you can hear sounds underwater, because even though the the water is compressing and decompressing and that compression in the pressure, right, higher and lower pressure, and for things to to do that, they have to have mass, um, to actually create a change in the pressure. Well, so, the medium um, the medium has mass. The medium, but, sorry, does, the medium. but does the sound have mass? Very good. Um, well, the, I get a lot of earwax, so I feel like that's an indicator. I, of TMI, something. <laughs> TMI, TMI. <laughs> but no, is that just the mass of all the sound that I'm hearing? Oh, oh, you collect it in your, in your yeah, ear canals. Yeah, you collect it in your ear canals. That's a new. You got to take it out with a Q-tip. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like See, I'm onto right. something, guys. You totally are. Okay. <laughs> 
the carrier of the sound, the thing that's carrying the sound, okay, um, has mass. Mm -hmm. Like, right? But actually, you know, you can say then, it's a very deep question, actually, because our perception of the sound, you know, sound is massless in that sense. <laughs> but but sound um, has energy, and energy, has energy equals MC squared, so there's a mass equivalent to the energy that's in the sound, I presume. That's that's absolutely true. That is okay. true. Okay. All yeah. right. So that, that bells them out of that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Nagin, see how many more questions you can squeeze in. Stefan, are you good at sound bites? I can try. Okay. <laughs> okay, so rapid right. fire section. Here we go. The anthropo uh, from Anthropocosmic Dylan uh, in San Diego writes question for Dr. Alexander. Neil says, quote, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to us. So how do the concepts of infinity and quantum mechanics get distorted due to our human condition? And how do you reconcile this gap with your research and your artistic expression through jazz music? Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, so, let, me tight, let me tighten up the beginning of that. So mm -hmm. so he's asking, if, if I say the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you, uh, are you, do these infinities make sense to you and does it bother you? Or do you keep going? Do you just accept it? Or because it doesn't make sense, you have to do something about it. And that violate the Neil principle. Very good. I, I, I like the Neil principle. I, mean, I, I, I adhere to it, actually. Because it doesn't make sense to me a lot of times. But, you know, but I have to pay my bills. And um, yep, yeah. oh, you gotta... continue. My take on this, I actually embrace the infinities. I embrace it. I said, let's live with the infinities. And wherever we can, try to sidestep it and make progress. And, um, yeah. I see. Okay. So you kind of, even if they're difficult, uh, it doesn't, shouldn't prevent you from making other kinds of discoveries uh, in the terrain that surrounds them. I get it. Okay. And how about the, uh, Nagin, the second part was about jazz. What, what was the, read that again. Yeah. Uh, they wrote, um, how do you reconcile this gap with your research and your art artistic expression through jazz music? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that's great about jazz music is that, you know, you, for, you know, it, it, it's a, a dual thing. You, you're always strug, striving to master your craft and, you know, and build on the foundations of others. But you also must try to break the rules and stumble and fall to make something new based on that foundation. So oh. really embracing the mistakes that you made and not being afraid of that. That's kind of what jazz improvisation is also about while at the same time building on the foundation and getting your chops together and practicing and all that good stuff. And there's surely some people who would say, would, would invoke the, neo, the nihilism on jazz. Mm. Jazz is under no obligation to make sense to you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. It's, right. I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure some people out there feel that. Well, there's right. a funny story about that, I Neil. Mean, I want to hear your thoughts about it very quickly. Um, when I first heard on at Coleman, I was like, what kind of... I, I, made no sense it didn't make any musical sense and then much later on in life as i thought i became more um advanced musically it started making sense to me <laughs> oh okay all right yeah. or, so it doesn't have to make sense up front that's right <laughs> also in in i would just uh for for when jazz doesn't make sense i usually go to the bar get another drink and then <laughs> jazz starts to make a make, lot make of sense, sense. Right. That's yeah. why jazz is in bars. That's why. <laughs> and also why all physicists and astrophysicists should be drinking when they talk about infinity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned something very cool, by the way. I'm very proud of this. I always feel like I was the outside of physicists that played music. It turned out that the hero, the guy that won the Nobel Prize, for figuring out how to actually deal with infinities and in our quantum field theory that led to the discovery of the Higgs boson. His name is Ken Wilson. I just found out that he played the oboe, like, you know, he okay. played when he was a, a postdoc, yeah. Except I don't know that the oboe shows up much in jazz concerts. <laughs> well, sure now it should. I'm, I'm pretty sure that that was not a first choice. <laughs> I know, the oboe feels like something you just get saddled with in middle school. Exactly. You don't choose it. <laughs> You're, in, in elementary school, that was you were the last in line. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. You get the oboe. Here now, is, he's, right? now he's saddled with a Nobel. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> well, let's take a question from Bruce Ryan. Bruce writes, um, I saw that Stefan's specialty includes quantum loop gravity, and I've always wanted to ask, what the heck is quantum loop gravity? Yeah, me too. Me too. Count me in that well, question as well. Those that 
there, there, there are other theorists that do not like the fact that I used to work on Lupin Agra or still think about it. So they said it was loopy. <laughs> that was okay. Yeah, right, yeah. But that can't yeah. be a compliment. It's definitely not a compliment. <laughs> I know. Compliment. I know. That doesn't sound good. That sounds like being saddled with the oboe. Okay. Yeah. It's a yeah. beautiful, it is, it's a very tantalizing idea. And it actually does deal with, with gravitational infinities in, in some respects. And the idea is really interesting. You know, like how, let's go back to our picture of the magnet. You know, if you actually can see a magnetic field line um, with these iron filings, you see that it's like, some of it is concentrated in like a tube, like a magnetic tube. Well, what loop quantum gravity is saying is that imagine that you can make tubes of gravitational fields and sort of loop them around like um, like chains, like, you know, like a chain. But I can a chain, have like, a link in a chain, like a, a link, link in a chain. chain. And I can yeah. link I can link a fabric of space time with those with those loops. Like, um, right. Mm. Um, like, like those those remember those um, those um, T-shirts, those Jamaican guys used to wear, um, you know, with, with the little holes anyway. So um... no, I'm sorry, I don't. I don't, I don't. <laughs> that doesn't ring a bell at all. No, neither with me. And I'm and I'm in this hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, exactly right, right. So he um, hails from some other summertime, two hemispheres away. And I don't. I think we don't have no idea. So it's like, yeah. Imagine you zoom into my fabric, this fabric of the show, yeah. and you start seeing it, it like loops and links and that kind of stuff. So that's the okay. idea of loop quantum gravity. But what's linking is a gravitational field, and they're kind of you can think of them as atoms of space. So um, yeah. So. Oh, I see. Not atoms, pixels of space. Pic pixels. Even better. Yeah. Even yeah. better. Pixels, pixels of, space. of space. Yes. The smallest unit of space. Yeah. The smallest okay. unit of space. And I mean, that idea, that theory is still in play. In fact, okay. I will be seeing the, one of the founders of that theory, Abai Ashtakar, very soon. And He's they're coming especially to get loopy. They're especially loopy. We, they're especially, told. yeah. Yes. <laughs> they love roller coaster rides, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 All right, Nagin, we might have time for one, maybe one and a half more questions. Okay, yeah. so let's see. Abhinav Yadov from Philly asks, I struggle to think about space-time as a concept that exists in our daily lives. As a medium, though, which light wave travels? As a medium, though, which light wave travels? As a fabric that gets shaped by mass and as a vacuum out of which virtual particles pop in and out of, what's an easier way to think about space-time? Well, the same uh, the, <laughs> silence. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> wait, 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 what was that? What was that question? <laughs> wait, space time is all those things. So, what is the question? I guess, uh, yeah. There's like there's a there's a, a grammatical something missing that's making it hard to. Yeah, we need some semicolons, question. but we need some semicolons, but so all those things are I true, think, right, I, Stefan? They're all going on mm -hmm. in space time, right? And yes, what's what's the easiest way of thinking about the concept of of space time. Okay, so if all that's going on in space time, yeah. what's the first way you teach it? You don't dump the, the, the bucket onto people before they know what's going on. What's your first step to say what space time is? To like a yeah. kid. Um, yeah, so I would say that, yeah, I, 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 think it's, I think it's a good analogy to think of space time as some sort of very, very faint, um, an invisible um, fabric um, that, but it's a special kind of fabric because that fabric can also support space time itself to move along like gravitational waves, right? So space time itself can actually support motion of uh, ripples up itself. And, it, and that is different than any other types of medium that we know, right? Normally, Something like like an electric field or particles need space time to move through, but they can't move through their own you know, their own medium. Space time has a it's a very special type of medium in that sense, but um, it's a very weird medium, for lack of a better word. It's what we call it's a re, it's a relational medium. Okay. <laughs> And nor is it under any obligation to make sense to us. Yes, okay. But it right. just it sounds like no, what, it, what you described is kind of like... It still makes no sense to me, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the answer to this person's question is basically there's no way of really thinking about it in your daily life. <laughs> it's like, you no, know, I mean, again, this is what, what Neil just said. It makes no sense. But I know I could write down this object called a space-time metric and we describe it as a field of, you know, space-time as some kind of a field. But again, these are just words that mm -hmm. we attach to the equations that we, we we write down yeah but they make predictions and they work so they make yeah. very good predictions and they work very well yeah, yeah. so that's why however fantastic 
skeptical they sound, mm -hmm. they still are connected to reality in that important way. So it's very. I mean, very the good. detection of gravitational waves so with LIGO yeah. and Virgo. Yep. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And so. Now, again, I think we got one more question. So, Last I mean, one. this is sort of like related. Everyone seems to be having a crisis in understanding. But Mal Malcolm Marfan um, from Trinidad and Tobago says infinity oh. is often described as a mathematical abstraction. How can we know that the concept of infinity exists in the physical world and not just in our minds? They are really testing you today. I, yeah, they are, Stefan. They want hard answers. <laughs> and I tell you, I, I remembered learning infinity mathematically, and they said one divided by zero is undefined. Okay? I yes, remember yeah. being taught that in my math class. Well, mm -hmm. I have a math friend who we actually had as a guest, um, John Allen Paulos, professor of math at uh, Temple University outside of Philly. And I tweeted, I called him out in, in Twitter, and mm -hmm. I said, John, if one one divided by zero is undefined, why don't you guys define it? <laughs> what are you waiting for? Okay. <laughs> I've been waiting my whole life, and all you have to do is define it, and we're cool. What's up with that? So so apparently to him, infinity is undefined, because one divided by zero is infinity, mm -hmm, kind of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So wait, yeah. I, so this thing is just totally up for grab. Like I could just do a, a, a journal, right? Like a, a journal article right now, and just be like, one divided by infinity is a bowl of jello, and like that's. <laughs> if this is no, up for an, grabs, I'd like to no, take I, a stab. We have to put closure oh. on your theory, and one divided by zero is an asymptote captured in Tupperware. <laughs> 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 That's beautiful. I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah. And that that that's a that's a beautiful theorem right there, right there. We got to call it quits there. Stefan, great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me again, Neil. And it's great to to meet you, Nagin. I, I look forward to checking your stuff out. For sure. So All great right. to meet you. All right, Nagin. Uh, it's been a delight. And and by the way, Nagin, just quickly, weren't you? on TV with Hillary Clinton? Did I, did I, I'm channel surfing. Just, that's Nagin. Wait, that's Hillary Clinton. That's that's right. she, what did they do it? Yes. What, what was that? Briefly, tell me real quick. She was, I'm on the show Gutsy on Apple TV. Um, Hillary Clinton is just basically um, doing a series about gutsy women. And I, and crazily, I, um, I'm one of them. So check You're it out. It's a really great women. series. Okay, it's, it's just called Gutsy. Yeah, it's called Gutsy on Apple TV. Gutsy. Very cool. But I don't mean to I don't mean to brag, but Hillary Clinton said I'm her favorite astrophysicist. Oh well, uh, Yeah, I'm sure I'm pretty sure she knows only one astrophysicist. <laughs> That's the problem. No, I mean, hey, that should uh if I had that it would be on you know, I would take it it would be on my gravestone. But be there. I would okay. Oh the you, best is when I meet my favorite musician and, and and he goes, Hey, by the way, can you can you can you get me introduced to Neil deGrasse Tyson, please? <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, guys, we're done right. here. Land this plane. This has been Star Talk Cosmic Queries, the Infinity Edition. Uh, it's a delight to have an old friend and colleague, Stefan Alexander, and Nagin Persad. Always good to have you back. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, as always, bidding you to keep looking up.